delighted to see you all. Welcome. Uh, my name is Oliver Hurry. Um, I am chair and founder of the Scope 3 Peer Group uh, and also work with the Sustainable Kiln Pledge, which you'll hear more about from Bertrand here. Um, delighted to be here. I was here with Gabrielle uh, a year ago. I think the podium was that side, if I remember rightly, but we were still talking about Scope 3. So hopefully uh, plenty of you are new because you're going to hear hopefully a bit of new stuff, but some of the age old problems. Uh, let's have a quick show of hands to find out what who in the room has any idea what they're doing on Scope 3? <laughs> Not bad. Do you want to come up and talk? Because <laughs> it is a big challenge. So um, we're going to be talking about Scope 3. God bless it. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about the, the second most important buzzword in the world, which is collaboration. So I think what we're actually going to talk about is how to work together to reduce emissions in supply chains. That's what we're really focusing on today. So a wonderful panel here with us uh, today. We've got Dr. Syed Ebrahimi from uh, Alpha Energy and Edison Company, if Edison Energy Company, got to get it right. Um, we have Stephen Jamison, Head of Circular Economy at SAP. We have Gabrielle Gina, Head of Environmental Sustainability at BT Group. Great to see you again. And we have my good friend, Bertrand Conqueret, of, uh, who basically leads supply chain and procurement at Henkel and is also the co-founder of the Sustainable Procurement Pledge. So um, delighted to have you here. Uh, no pressure. Um, the room doesn't know what they're talking about on Scope 3, so we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Anything we'll say will be good. So um, inevitably, I want to have your questions. I, I, look, there's no point us talking up here without really knowing what you want to talk. So let's try and get as many questions in as possible. So go and use Slido give us lots of questions, do lots of voting, and we'll hopefully get to what you really want to know rather than just what we think you want to know, but hopefully it'll be very good. So we have to deal with the elephant in the room, which is collaboration and how you do it, um, particularly when it comes to Scope 3. So Patron, we have to start with you, I'm afraid. Collaboration, sustainability, procurement, working together. How do you do it? Well, how we do it? We do it together, and it looks uh, a very trivial what I'm saying, but we do it together it means that into my journey as CPO 13 years ago, uh, when I got the question of my CEO, can we have our supply base compliant, I had a feeling that I was in front of a big cliff. And this is why with uh, a bit of a chance, but by coincidence, I met with five other CPOs, and after one afternoon of discussion and a bit more, uh, we uh, created Together for Sustainability. On that journey, 13 years later, we have been able to tackle environmentals, audit, assessment, uh, and uh, recently we tackled the scope three. Uh, we'll talk later about, about details on this, um, but creating a methodology across the chemical industry. Today, 51 companies working together, 51 CPOs, courageous people, more than 15,000 people. It's collaboration every day. Four years ago, with my colleague and friend, uh, Thomas Udesen, we were discussing on a Saturday morning on what about these kids in the street with Greta around the globe, having gray hair, what am I doing? And this is where SPP is born, to say we are all procurement and procurement we decide on who do we want to have in our supply base. So imagine that we all work together following the United Nations principles, the Global Business Compact, imagine. And this is where the pledge born, this is where we met. So collaboration, CPO in a company, TFS, steering committee, leading uh, the change on the business sector, and SPP are uh, targeting the entire profession of uh, procurement, public and private companies. And it's all about collaboration. It's all about data. It's all about principles. But at the end of the day, it's all about leadership and collaboration starts with me. And this is what uh, I like also to further share yeah. along the discussion with you. Yeah, that's good. And it, it, collaboration means internal collaboration, procurement and sustainability working together. It means peers working together. It means supply chains, value chains working together. Collaboration is working together, not just talking together. And I think you're evidence of that. Gabrielle, you are uh, famously part of lots of different initiatives and collaborations because you guys are very good at it at BT. So maybe you can give a flavour <laughs> of how you guys collaborate. Yeah, I just wanted to start with one example. Um, so we're a member of something called the Joint Alliance for uh, CSR. Uh, it's a membership organization of 27 telcos. So we're all competitors, actually, global competitors. So it's BT, Deutsche Telekom, Orange, AT&T. So 
all the people that we compete with, we actually collaborate because we have the same supply chain. And um, we did a survey um, asking about climate activities amongst the telcos. 93% um, of us have science-based or net zero targets. If we look at our scope three emissions, uh, they tend to be over 80%. As an example for BT Group, our scope three emissions are 94%. That's typical for our sector. So 85% um, of Jack members have uh, a scope three reduction target. So how are we going to do this? How can we do this together? So um, we did a report. Um, we agreed a joint call to action and best practice examples for our, our suppliers. We had, we launched it on social, we did webinars and basically said our expectations, because if we have common expectations as an industry, that makes it easier for our suppliers as well. So we said, you know, we expect you to have a science-based target. We expect you to report on it publicly and annually. We expect you to look at buying renewable electricity and we expect you to engage with your suppliers in turn. Another organization we are part of with other um, telcos around the world, um, we come together and we ask our common suppliers to disclose to CDP. So we are part of the CDP supply chain program. Again, one voice coming from industry, this is our expectation. But it's not only about setting expectations, of course, it's also about the capacity building. You know, where do suppliers start? What is this all about? So we're a founding a member of something called 1.5 Supply Chain Leaders, together with an organization called the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. So we set this up with Ericsson, one of our suppliers, with Unilever, with IKEA, and with the Swedish telco Telia. Basically to look at, well, what have we as companies learned, because we've been working on supply chain for a long time. How we can, can we communicate that best practice um, to other companies starting to, on this journey? What do suppliers need to do? And we also work together to set up the SME Climate Hub. Realizing, well, what about SMEs? That's a completely you know, different story compared to some of the big companies you're seeing here. You know, what is a carbon footprint? Where do you start? What's appropriate to the SMEs? So again, trying to gather that best practice um, and we've also worked here in the UK um, with other with our competitors again uh, through something called um, the digital connectivity forum and set out guidance for SMEs in the telco sector specifically so again it's it's all about you know creating that bigger impact and being more than just BT groups so more voices and trying to get this to become the norm and set the expectations. Excellent. And a uh, quick show of hands and please play along. Who in the room is a practitioner in a company who isn't part of a peer group with their peers on this challenge? You all are. No, there's a couple of you. Excellent. There is an initiative for everything. Trust me. It's my day job <laughs> to try and sort them all out. I have a Google Doc of 287 different sustainable procurement initiatives in the world. There are too many. But as I said, if you join the right ones and understand the right reasons, then the guides are excellent. I will throw out, just mention a few things. A Google exponential roadmap, a supply, a supplier action guide. It's a fantastic supplier engagement guide on scope three. So check that out as well. Stephen, data, pretty critical for collaboration. SAP, Famously pretty good at it. What does it mean to you when it comes to Scope 3? Yeah, it comes up sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's an interesting topic. You know, we look across our, our customer base, you know, uh, almost everything that's bought and sold in the world will touch an SAP system at, at some point. Our role in helping the world sort of understand this, this big picture is, is probably self-evident. But what we, what we found is that over the years we've been looking at this, um, we ran a survey last year, 9% of the world actually can you know, put their hand on their heart and say they've got a pretty good grip on their scope three emissions. And I dare say the hands in the room kind of today sort of represented that view. Um, and, and the way we look at this is we say, well, you know, we've got a business network that's transacting, you know, this trillion, trillions of, of dollars worth of, of financial activity. It's five and a half million businesses around the world. But how do you actually unlock that in a way that's useful in a way that is working for people? So we joined our, an, another initiative, uh, the WBCSD um, Pathfinder for Carbon Transparency, or PACT. Um, we worked closely with um, 
with a number of, of industry participants in the detergent supply chain. Um, and uh, what's, in, what's unique about this is, is what we recognised early on was that the risk was that each technology company, each sort of mega vendor, if you like, would go and create its own perspective, its own solution. And that's going to get us nowhere at the end of the day. So what we've done with the Pathfinder initiative is we've worked with, uh, collaboratively with the ecosystem, with the detergent supply chain as our kind of focal point initially, to be able to look end to end uh, through to, um, you know, what are, the, what are the data standards? What are the protocols? How do we, as essentially a collection of parties, uh, have a good communication about the, 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 the uh, carbon emissions topic? So we've taken that discussion forward. We've, uh, uh, I guess, productized it into something called SAP Sustainability Data Exchange. It's a part of our network uh, offering. Actually, we're working closely with, with BT uh, to help sort of scale that across the business, uh, business base. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's through those sorts of innovations that we're hoping to take that scale, but also find collaborations that then can, can unlock that for the benefit of the wider, wider community. Excellent. Uh, and just to emphasize that, uh, PACT, P-A-C-T, WBCSDs, it is an incredibly important initiative. It is helping to align all of these technologies on the right way of measuring car product carbon footprints and getting consistency in those data. If you're looking at tools and platforms, make sure that those tools and platforms are aware of PACT, are talking to them, and potentially one day will be conformant to it. I can't emphasize uh, that enough. In fact, together for sustainability and chemicals, uh, we're working very closely with PACT as well to get consistency in how they're measuring product carbon footprints. So sorry, your um, business really actually gets stuff done in supply chains, it actually makes uh, reductions in energy happen. So what does collaboration mean to you? I think uh, just to put it a bit in context, we touched on strategy a bit on data and collaboration. So uh, as consultants, we try to um, read different sectors, you know, different priorities. Um, sustainability and maturity is a huge consideration. Sectors like the aviation, automotive might be quite advanced. Agri-food might be lagging. So we have this um, overarching um, um, strategy that we do, and we've got a white paper out, that, um, out there for it that looks at data prioritizations and insights. I'm not going to bore you with the details of 80-20 spend-based method, whether uh, you want to move to more granular assessments, supply specific data. Um, but for, for us, collaboration is a huge step, and we do that um, by meeting suppliers at where they are in this journey. So making sure that you appreciate, you know, the publicly listed companies, those ones that are more mature, tail end, and making sure you have a customized trainings um, uh, and um, seminars that we can sort of develop for them. And um, we have these things called office hours that we advocate for suppliers. They can reach out to us. And more, more importantly, we then look at how we could target specific cohorts to make more informed understanding of these challenges of certain suppliers. So for us, it's quite important. And one of the probably most challenging things is getting procurement to understand what we really require from them. Coming from a supply chain background and an academic background, for me personally, before this um, endeavor in sustainability, um, and purchase and supply chain were predominantly lead time, flexibility, quality and cost. Now throw in all of these different environmental metrics is that procurement need to understand and all the politics, internal politics, who they need to report to. Yes, they do agree on a particular sustainability service, but then they have to report that to their board of directors and their directors and they need to understand. So making sure that the why is understood, not just the what and how, which we always try to bang on about. But if we can get procurement to understand why they are doing this, then they can convey that to other parties inside their business. And then all of a sudden you have this cross-functional integration, which is necessary. Then you can really look at supplier and customer integration. Yeah, excellent. And you raised the point there that procurement is absolutely key to scope three. I mean, the world's emissions are mostly in supply chains. Procurement runs supply chains. Procurement's going to save the world. It's as simple as that, isn't it, Patrol? Um, <laughs> but the realities are procurement engagement is very important. So another thing for you to be checking out. Um, so I mentioned the Sustainable Procurement Pledge. So spp.earth, if you Google that, it is free support for your procurement professionals all around the world and it's all freely available. World Sustainable Procurement Day is a 24-hour live marathon of content free for procurement professionals that's on the 21st of March. What a great excuse to engage your procurement teams internally so highly recommend that. 
OK, now I think another thing that probably people are thinking in the audience, but we'll have a look at the Slido in a bit, is I have loads of suppliers, or how do I choose which are the most strategic, or I've got lots of service suppliers, everything seems to be about product carbon footprints, or it's just really complex to understand my suppliers. So perhaps we can start with you, Stephen. How do people get around the fact that they either have too many suppliers, don't know who they are, don't understand them, don't know who to talk to? How do we deal with that complexity of of supply chains? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a very an incredibly common challenge, I guess, across our, our customer base. And what we see is, uh, you know, really it's about how do you slice the elephant, essentially? You know, how do we segment that challenge up into something that's manageable? Um, often in terms of, you know, maturity, are we uh, talking about organizations that, you know, have a very good grip on what they're doing at the moment, some that, uh, to the other end of the extreme, those that have, you know, got no clue no, and don't know where to start? So uh, helping organizations to sort of segment their supplier base um, through our SAP Ariba solutions, this is all possible through uh, that solution area. Um, and you're able to then look at, you know, how do I target resources? How do I target, um, you know, interventions, whether it's training, whether it's, you know, handholding in order to be able to um, support, you know, those groups in terms of that journey. So working closely with the, you know, organizations in the um, food business, CPG, across the uh, high tech electronics specifically, um, where we're looking at, you know, how to really sort of roll out initiatives. So being able to support, you know, the projection of targets through into the full supply base and then how to sort of support that with, with enablement and training materials uh, you know, that are able to target the right people in the right way. Um, so it's through that sort of uh, holistic approach uh, and through that segmentation that, you know, we see our customers being able to sort of move the needle. Yeah, excellent. And Gabriel, you famously at BT have had a fantastic supply engagement program for some time on Net Zero, and you've got a fascinating supply chain, lots of different companies in it. How do you guys deal with what to engage which suppliers with? How do you deal with that elephant? Yeah, so we look at uh, and analyze who are the the carbon intensive. What, what's the highest carbon of the of these suppliers? Um, often that quite correlates quite closely to our spend data, so we can see who do we spend the most with, and then also that tends to be where the most carbon um, comes from. So again, around segmentation. Um, just wanted to give an, an example on again coming back to collaboration and engaging one to one with suppliers. So. As part of Jack, which I mentioned before, um, some of the, the telcos in that uh, association work together on a supplier engagement program. So we each pick five suppliers um, because, again, we have common suppliers. Um, one that came on my list was Ericsson, who I had a close relationship with. And then it's about one on one engagement with Ericsson to say, OK, Give me a volume product, high carbon volume product that you sell to BT. What is it? So they gave us this base station and we said, OK, um, what can we do to reduce carbon in the production of that? Turns out it was uh, manufactured in Poland. Um, they spoke to the factory who switched to renewable electricity. So fantastic. So immediately, you know, the carbon footprint for us of this product reduced. Um, but it doesn't stop there because, you know, as BT, we didn't buy that many of it. But that, of course, again, has a positive effect on all the people, all the companies in Jack who purchase that product. So we can see this kind of snowball effect just by starting that one to one engagement. We can benefit the wider, the wider industry. Um, but coming back to, you know, how do we deal with all of them? Um, I think for us, you know, realistically, 11, 12,000 suppliers, um, the SMEs and, and smaller companies, um, you know, it really is pointing to resources like the SME Climate Hub, and this is where you need to go because, yeah, we can't engage with them. We've done, um, we engaged around 135 suppliers um, last year, uh, me specifically with my, with my chief procurement officer. So we did a webinar. We also, with CDP, to say these are our expectations of you on science-based target. There were follow-ups, there were emails and training. So, you know, picking out those 135, which were the highest carbon uh, suppliers that we had. Excellent. Uh, just to emphasize again, smeclimatehub.org. Uh, so my scope pick group advises the SME. Send all of your SMEs and tail spend to the SME Climate Hub. Free support, uh, great academies, great training, and also a really improving reporting mechanism where you will be able to use the SME Climate Hub to say, are my SME suppliers on here? Have they reported or not? Etc. Etc. And that's 
being developed and is going to be launched very soon. So a fantastic tool for that tail spend and, and SMEs. So Patron, chemicals. Everyone supplies everyone, don't they, in chemicals? You're very it's incestuous uh, as an industry. So how do you deal with the complexity of your supply chain and what do you do to tackle that with Scope 3? Well, I think that you're right. <clears throat> it's, uh, it is an ecosystem. Uh, but that ecosystem is a, is a big opportunity because being a good opportunity, you, you can realize very quickly that it is an ecosystem of data at the end of the day. Um, and um, it is an ecosystem into which to, to, to go into that agenda, it is important to develop a language. So this is how we tackled it. But first, we had to take an op a, a decision. Number one, uh, the topic of scope three is under the leadership of the procurement. No one else will do it. So the problem is in the room. It is not outside. Someone has to take ownership. In, of course, uh, collaboration with everybody, but it's a matter of ownership and deciding that we will do it. Number two, it is very important to realize that what, do we, what are we aiming at? It's transparency, it's traceability, it's measurement to do what? On one hand, reportings, on the other hand, measurements to design and to adapt and to reduce the famous carbon footprint. Uh, when we understand that, we can start to work. Uh, it is also important to understand which direction. Scope 3 is monumental. We have more than one chapter in Scope 3. So here we talk very often about 3.1, the direct materials, or eventually logistics, or eventually IT spent. The more we use also artificial intelligence, also the more the footprint increases on top of water. So all of that has to be targeted. When you do this, the most important is to realize that ecosystem can only work if we do not repeat all the same at the same time. It's a waste of, waste of time, of energy. So this is where into TFS we brought that on the table and a very courageous team designed and developed a methodology. We have to understand what it is. We have not reinvented the wheel by um, taking uh, something new. We took the best of WSPD, Catena X, um, the Greenhouse um, Gas Compact. We took all the best, but we did it specifically for um, the uh, chemical industry. People have worked day and night, voluntary, 20 companies. That's a momentum. After 18 months, 18 months. Why 18 months? Because we have a clock which is ticking, 2030. So by September 22, people were ready. By November, we, we, we have it confirmed and we distribute it across the entire industry. We don't keep it into the chemical industry. But now we have a language. If we have a language, we can start to train it. So there is a TFS Academy. That Academy is in 10 languages. We can train around the globe. It's education. Like this morning, Emily Evans was talking about education. It's all about education. Learn it, engage. Then we can start to talk and work together. And now we have been developing a data exchange. So we were into the market, we found a platform which was existing with encrypted um, um, data management, which is a platform of Siemens. Could have been XYZ. It is with Siemens, Seagreen, we have that partnership and we pilot this. We have to exchange millions of data live in the next future. And after that, we have to be able to take it into our companies and to bring it to each final plants and each final uh, element into the organization. So it's a huge work. You just need to stand up and jump out of the box. That's the only way. But together, no time to lose and just learn by working together. And uh, you, you mentioned your organizations, there are many. And I think these organizations are really ecosystems and these ecosystems have to take it. It's the ecosystem in my company, it's the ecosystem in my business sector. And now we have the ecosystem about procurement. Why? Just to share, we can make it. It's a matter of design, it's a matter of willingness, it's a matter of leadership. It's feasible, it's really feasible. It's a massive agenda, it's a massive agenda, but together, all together in the room, imagine we leave this room and we all work on it. We change the world as of tomorrow. I love it when it gets going. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so, uh, uh, again, if you're looking at product carbon footprints, you must Google Together for Sustainability's PCF guidelines. There isn't an industry on the planet who hasn't done more on PCFs. They're chemists. 
They're really good at this sort of stuff, okay? And plus chemicals is on almost everything. So any work you do on product carbon footprint should refer to the PCF guidelines. Of uh, there is this, this morning, there is a new paper about the, you will love it. It's about data model. So we have PCF data model. We have PCF guideline. Now we have a PCF data model. We have a PCF exchange solution. And the next one will be how to integrate it into the ERPs. That's for you guys. Yeah, no excuses. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, we're gonna move on. Uh, there is a, the obvious question in the room before we get into your questions. This is, uh, scope three is about making a number go down. It's not about measuring it to death. If we just keep on measuring and paralyzing ourselves with frustration, we won't get anywhere. There are 70 months left for till 2030. 70, crikey. I mean, last month, it was like it almost didn't happen. Um, so actual reductions. Let's get on to the elephant in the room. How do we make actual reduction? I have to start with you, side here. So what do we do on scope three to make sure we're actually getting stuff done? Thank you, Oliver. Probably that's one of the most challenging questions to answer. Um, to be honest with you, I'm very frank. I don't think there's a silver bullet. Um, however, um, having said that, I do agree with um, my colleagues here that there is a method to the madness. Um, we have experience with certain clients that have um, training sessions set for their supply chain and try to um, engage them and educate them, but at the same time, um, as Ankle mentioned, someone has to take responsibility. And I think here's uh, quite an important distinction between who is the supply chain owner and who are supply chain members that are facilitating and helping those owners. So supply chain owners, basically the power, the focal power in the supply chain, have the resources, the mites to make the changes. And through that, peer pressure starts and other suppliers follow suit. We have a particular client um, um, in the automotive sector, a global automotive manufacturer, that has a philosophy that they don't want to leave any supplier behind. But what they do is, at the beginning, they try to keep, well, we help them in this regard. We kept the um, uh, nets quite wide. We created training um, um, seminars that was applicable to everyone, quite generic. Upon that, um, we then, as I mentioned earlier on, have these things called office hours, which are very structured. We appreciate that supply chain trainings and seminars might be costly, so we give this as free to suppliers and extended supply chains. So they can come to us with any sort of um, um, questions they might have, um, small tail end SMEs, probably more than the more mature um, sustainability companies out there. Lastly but not least, we have this targeted cohort where, as was mentioned on, um, um, by, by, by BT, that we try to engage one-on-one -on -one and try to make a use case out of that. That will really help because it moves away from conceptualization, from words being thrown around to real life examples. And I think that space and our experience creates a lot of confidence for other suppliers to also align their so-called uh, climate ambitions. We found out um, aggregation is an, not an easy word to spell and e even more difficult to actually implement. Um, we have uh, virtual PPAs, but then we've realized that in regulated market versus deregulated market, it might mean very different things. And modern day supply chains are global. So in the UK, you might have regulated markets where you're assigned to electricity. You can't really then pick and choose where the emission factors are lower. In the US, they can pick and choose across that. So making sure that we appreciate that the different challenges are there, but at the same time, what works for one supplier, if that could be mimicked across the supply chain and uh, take it from there. Again, to reiterate, I think it's a, huge, huge aspiration. Supply chains are global. I think the GHG protocol with that 15 um, um, categories is oversimplifying the challenge that we have. So making sure that we, we get to um, each suppliers to where they are, meet their requirements, and as much as, as we can, generalize that across other supply chains. If not, then make sure that each use case is appreciated by one individual or one supplier. And again, top emitters, flexible suppliers, core competencies to these companies appreciated and tackled accordingly. Excellent. Okay. 
Good. Final quick points from everyone, then we'll go to some questions. Gabrielle. Yeah, just to, just to add to that. So um, I've actually been in this role since 2009, believe it or not, at BT. Um, and the first few years, I could pretty much, you know, sit in BT centre, do my own thing. No one cared about the sustainability, carbon footprints, whatever. Um, and then um, investors started asking about this, what were we doing on sustainability? But then the customers started asking. And all of a sudden, everybody started listening. What are we doing on sustainability? So I think, you know, what is going to drive that reduction? Uh, put sustainability criteria into your RFPs. We are now seeing up to 30% of our RFPs being linked to sustainability. You know, the government saying any contract uh, over 5 million um, that we're purchasing, you need a public carbon reduction plan signed by your, C by your board, by your CEO. Wow, okay, we're writing one. You know, this is what we're yeah. going to do. And I think that has been a massive driver. Yeah, I think uh, product carbon footprints and carbon footprints in general as a competitive advantage is not that far off. Uh, Bertrand? Uh, quickly, I mean, put sustainability targets, uh, well, bright, but also scope three into the target variable pay of your people. Um, then it helps uh, to put also that agenda. Why? Uh, I am born uh, as a CPO and as a procurement manager. It was all about price, cost, quality, service not sustainability. No, it is. Put it part of the pay. Put it part of the dashboard. Very important. Put it part of the decision-making process. And that's the journey. Now, it leads to one element, which I think where procurement are very good at, and we need to explore it. It is curiosity. Understand what suppliers are doing. Be with suppliers. Shape and decide with which supplier you want to go or not to go, and invest with them in their business as they progress. With this, the information we get are really helping to shape the data. Seven years ago, when we started on Scope 3, the data were not very good. Very bad. Today, still a lot is not good enough. But anyway, be curious and insist and bright it and make sure we get the data and the understanding. But the data doesn't speak. Speak with people. Engage with teams. Reduce teams. Focus on the one really involving and really investing. Change the game. Agreed. Stephen, day two is absolutely critical, but if we don't act on it? I think there's two, there's two things here. One, at the supply chain level, how do you have a strategy that brings together the material flow, the money flow, and the information flow? And how do you get that oversight end to end across that topic? And then secondly, at the business level, you know, how do you join together in the business organisation the creation of the, of the customer value proposition? How do you design your products to begin with? alongside how you then you know, uh, evolve your supply chain in order to, be able to satisfy that. And can you bring that kind of end-to-end -end perspective? Let's be honest, we're not just talking about emissions here, we're talking about all of the other topics, all the other attributes that come along with those materials. And so how do we make sure that we don't create a strategy that's sort of myopic on one topic, but then forgets nature or forgets you know, plastic pollution or whatever it might be? Um, so how we look at this as a system, uh, a system of innovation, a system of, of insight end-to-end -end is, the kind of the path to, uh, to taking this forward in a way that's truly sustainable. Excellent. Um, some really good questions. Get on the Slido now, though. We've got eight minutes left, and I'm going to do some rapid firing uh, here as well. Something that uh, Gabrielle mentioned was the importance of putting it into contracts. So if you Google the Chancery Lane project, as in the tube station, it is a freely available source, open source contract clauses. You can literally cut and paste the contract clauses and give them to your procurement sourcing team. It is literally that simple. It's not that simple to embed them in it but, and get, make people use them, but certainly to get the clauses. So definitely Google that. Right, uh, seven minutes we've got. So inevitable questions, I guess. Engaging leadership. Okay, how do we get buy-in from leadership for collaboration or just scope three in general? So very quick answers. Who wants to go first? Engaging leadership. Gabrielle? I, I think the, the fact that you have public targets. Uh, that's been a key driver for us. So, you know, this is out in the public domain. It's in the annual report and accounts. How are we doing? What are we doing about it? Bertrand mentioned bonuses, linking it to bonuses, and how our senior directors are being paid. Yep. Anything to add? Strategy, mm -hmm. obvious. Um, strategy of the company. Um, regulations, uh, more and more. Uh, but don't uh, put a company driven only by regulations. Put it on the core of the strategy and shape accordingly. Great question here, very relevant for what I'm working on at the moment here. Uh, will you commercialise or make contractual requirements for carbon reduction 
uh, from suppliers. So, will you? Um, how might it happen? Um, perhaps we can start with Stephen. Any thoughts on how you help suppliers to say we must have your carbon? Otherwise, to, to some extent, that we're, we're, our customers are already on this road. You know, they're, they're, they're putting this into their procurement systems. It's been put into their. Uh, into, into their, their briefs and it's it's been it's been inter intertwined with the targets that they're sort of laying out for the year ahead for two years ahead for five years ahead so I, I think that that as a sort of specification is sort of is is, is clear um is it scaling you know of course it could it could move much much more quickly okay so anything to add yeah i think um as uh, as, as mentioned um we have quite a lot of both regulations being passed down and also consumer demand. Uh, the newer generation online is creating a huge demand for businesses to be accountable for, for, uh, for their embodied carbon. And um, so it's a two sort of sides. Do you want to be caught in the physical risks, the actual risks that we're seeing, temperature going up, certain sectors like the agri-food are seeing drought, rainfall, and directly affect the economic bottom line. Other sectors such as um, banking and, um, and, and, and the more service-based sectors are seeing that if transitional risks, reputation, market demand, and, and that sort of transitional risks could be affecting them. So it could be um, and businesses don't want to be built higher for this. As consultants, we always tell them that it's not only about data. Obviously, 10 years ago, it was everyone wants this perfect data to start their journey. But now it's more about take actions right now, because if you don't, five years down the line, it's actually going to have physical costs on your businesses. Yeah. Let's go for it. Sorry for four words. Customers, listen to your customers. That's also innovation. Um, and uh, add to, to, to this uh, the ability to execute, uh, execute, execute, execute. Absolutely. Um, one thing that's happening at the moment, so at the moment I'm leading this group around the world of cross-initiative group with chief procurement officers involved who are going to intend to come up this year with a methodology of how they're going to include the cost of carbon in sourcing decisions, a methodology, a consistent methodology. One case study that's really fresh, it's only a few weeks old, Halion, H-A-L-E-O-N, the GSK business, the split business that's done for have gone out to 400 suppliers in the last few weeks and said, if you don't give us a product carbon footprint, we will take your eco invent emission factor and we will add 50%. That's an incredibly bold thing to do. And that is going to be the start of a provocation to suppliers around the world to say, here's a new reason to go and get that. <laughs> go and get that. Uh, go and get that data. So, worth worth looking that up. Um, right. What else have we got here? Um, what does the resourcing model look like for your teams to tackle this? So, very good question, uh, Gabrielle. How many huge numbers of people have you got working on Scope Three? Surely it's thousands, isn't it? Is it thousands? <laughs> or is it just you? <laughs> oh, that's such a funny question. Uh, you know, people ask me, "Oh, how many people are on your team?" You're looking at it. <laughs> um, I, I, I think looking at this resourcing. So I sit in BT Group in corporate affairs. So I look at thought leadership. I look at strategy, target setting, uh, external advocacy. Um, the implementation, of course, of this has to happen through procurement, right? So it has to come down to the procurement organizations and also to the, to the individual buyers. Um, so they need to help us reinforce the messaging, talk to, you know, their suppliers, their categories about these are the BT expectations, these are, are the, the requirements. So it's quite a, a devolved um, model, so to speak. We're very slim in the center, uh, but then how do we work within the teams? Yeah, excellent. Um, a really good resource, again, if you want to understand how your resourcing budget and headcount compares to your peers on Scope 3. If you go to scope3benchmark.com, it's a free resource, takes about half an hour to complete, and it will tell you, and more importantly, tell your boss how under-resourced you are on Scope 3 compared to your peers. <laughs> it's very popular, I can assure you. Um, you should Oliver, Oliver, excuse me to interrupt. Uh, the community, SPP, fantastic resources. Yep. Together for sustainability, fantastic resources. What you don't have exists outside. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Taking Slido to one side, is there anyone in the room that wants to ask a question? We've got a minute and a half left. Anyone want to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah. David, is it? Yeah. He is David, isn't he? Yeah. She's just coming. And then there was one at the back. Yeah. Okay. We'll go up to you first. 
Um, David Greenfield, Circular Economy uh, Institute. Um, just a quick one about legis legitimacy of data. Um, who is actually making sure that the data that is being presented is actually the data that Another elephant is in the room. I feel uh, like I'm looking at you, Stephen. I don't know why. Don't know why? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, over to you. Talk to our clients. Um, uh, well, great question. I mean, I, I think our our, um, our, our general uh, you know approach to this is that you know first of all we're pr delivering systems that are following certain accounting standards and uh, uh, and, uh, and and industry practices, and you know those are of course you know audited by the powers that be. The, the reality is. Of course, there is a, a massive gap, and of course, there is a huge uh, sort of acceptance uh, tolerance, if you like, in terms of that, um, uh, in terms of the, the sort of the reality and what the industry, you know, the, the global community at large has sort of accepted as being sort of reasonable um, for for now, and that that cuts across many domains. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think our, our approach to that as SAP is to say, as far as possible, we're always going to drive primary data so we have a you know uh, underlying all of our solutions at the moment is a sort of principle of treating carbon like money um and relying on you know transactional car um transactional um you know fact-based data at the primary level which then is communicated across networks yeah. uh, in order for that sort of transparency and that uh, auditability to be brought through to the surface it's a journey yeah, it's not perfect. Get on with it anyway. Uh, you know, don't wait for perfect. You'll hear that cliche every scope free conference. Just get on with it. Worry about it later. Um, but you need to get started. And um, let's take one. I'm going to be naughty. Let's take one more question. Go on. So, um, hi, Aris Vretos, Croda International, um, specialty chemical. So we work with TFS. We, act, by the way, do audits on on data. And so that there's there's an extra level of, of scrutiny there. We. It doesn't cover everything, so there's a lot of data, you know, particularly when it comes to nature, biodiversity, and all those tricky issues, so we're not addressing everything, but carbon is definitely there. The difficult thing is, how do you get that onto the formulation choices? You know, how do you get the business to redesign, and how long that takes to redesign the product so you can actually get to reduce your, your, your emissions? And how do you accelerate that? How do you not wait for three, five, ten years and get to something which is way beyond to make an impact by 2030? There's only one man, I think, who finishes off. Go on. If, if I may, I think instead of redesigning, at least for the time being, what I try to, to, to do is more on the design, on the future, uh, and then to, 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 to really test that this through the innovation. And then that means whatever we put in the future on the marketplace must integrate these parameters. Uh, and then learn from do it. Excellent. Thank you to our panel. <laughs> Same time next year, Gabrielle. Same time next year. Yeah, we'll be back in.